This year, the average cost of property in the UK has risen to a jaw-dropping £2,000 per square metre. The problem is, sometimes my eyes are bigger than my wallet. That's the only problem. <laughs> Pricing millions of us out of the market for more spacious homes. It's just really depressing living here. We have to open the cupboard like this. All of this needs to be dug away and then properly rebuilt. That's kind of scary. But some people have the vision to see beyond cramped and ugly spaces. So that looks like a sauna from the 1970s. Yeah. Yeah. You come in the front door yeah. and have a glorious view of the throne. In this series, I meet families who are refusing to let a lack of cash deny them their dream home. So how much do you have? 25. So reaching for the stars. You've got to have the dream. Almost 200,000 households applied for planning permission last year. For most of us, these builds are a once-in-a-lifetime project. We've never extended a property before. I have seen some horrendous mistakes. With no guarantee of success. Probably the worst night's sleep we've had since we started the build. Everybody, I think, has just about had enough. It's all going to come crashing down like a hideous earthquake of horror. It's chaos. <laughs> But get it right there. And the home of your dreams. So fantastic. All this glass. Could be right on your doorstep. Amazing. Look at this. Bit of a change. Sparkling, shiny and new. I'm excited. I'm like a kid at Christmas. Did you ever think that you would live in a home like this? Never. Wow. We've done a good job. In many places, house prices are now at a seven-year high. So for most of us, the dream home is out of reach. Now might be the time to find the perfect plot and turn a less perfect home into something fabulous. This week, I'm with two couples who are trying to do just that. That look is there to kill me later. Jim Joel and his partner Elaine have views to die for but want to build a massive extension on a minuscule budget. I think I can get hold of 25K myself and remortgage the house to borrow another 25. Once that money's gone, that would be it. I'm confident that he can do it. Not really. <laughs> but first, I'm off to Kent to meet Dr Tabitha Rawlinson and husband IT consultant Paul. They moved from Reading three years ago in search of their dream home and an idyllic rural lifestyle, and eventually found this 18th century picture-perfect cottage. The property was just breathtaking, so I would really be um, happy to stay in for the rest of my life. I have not had a property do that for me before. They found the plot of their dreams for £360,000, but although the magical cottage blew them away, the size of it was less than ideal. We moved in uh, from a four bed to a two bed. When we moved here, we were a family of three, so two beds was fine. But um, we had another baby, George, so now the children are sharing one room. To create their dream home, Tabitha and Paul hope to sympathetically double its size with an extension which will restore the property to its former glory. The house used to be much bigger than this. Unfortunately, in the late 70s, there was a fire that destroyed probably about half of the property. We found an old photograph, so we decided that's how we wanted to restore it. And that's part of where our anxiety lies. It needs to maintain the character of the older part of the property. They came in search of countryside, and boy, did they find it boasting two acres of magical gardens, meadowlands and outbuildings galore. It's the perfect wilderness for three-year-old William and baby George. To have all of the gardens is going to be fabulous for these two growing up with little secret areas and uh, so much space to run around in. Gotcha. <laughs> 
Paul and Tabitha's cottage is in the pretty hamlet of Selinge, just outside Folkestone in Kent. The county is known as the Garden of England. House sales have been increasing here by a whopping 25% year on year, pushing prices up. So this is the house that you'd ideally like to be able to buy? Yeah. <laughs> If money were no object, Paul and Tabitha's dream home would be this 19th century former schoolhouse with its five bedrooms and open plan living space. I love the character. It's really quirky inside and a lot of original features as well. The sort of thing that we really like. The open plan so we can keep an eye on the children wherever we are. Yeah. A house like this would be worth somewhere around 850,000. Your house is worth about 360,000, so you'd need nearly half a million pounds to come and buy something like this. So how much have you got? We've got 150,000. Okay, so you're 350,000 pounds short. So the only solution is to get building. Yeah. Yes. See what you can conjure up. Tabitha and Paul's dream house is worth well over twice as much as their current home. Their cottage would fetch about £360,000, leaving them short by close to half a million. They have less than a third of that to create their perfect rural retreat. One thing their money doesn't need to buy them is charm. This is the most fantastic garden with quirky little outbuildings, which mean, really, you could do almost anything with this house. But inside, the cottage is more on the scale of a doll's house than a growing family. There's two beds upstairs, and on the ground floor is a dining room and a tiny kitchen. In the lounge, there's space, but you almost need a telescope to see it. This is serious stargazing, isn't it? This is not a little hobby. Uh, I'd like bigger, <laughs> but obviously I'm struggling for space as it is. The children's toys tend to sort of congregate here. We're all cramped into this one room, really. While Paul's hobby takes pride of place in the lounge, in the kitchen, there's not enough room for the essentials. Where's the fridge? In, in the, the dining, dining room. room. <laughs> what you're hoping for is to end up with a kitchen that's big enough to be able to have people eating it and see where they are. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And with two small children, I'd like to be able to keep a better eye on them than I can at the moment with the individual rooms. The dream is a delightful, spacious cottage, carefully extended to retain its original charm. Paul and Tabitha hope to build out on the ground floor to create a huge open-plan kitchen, diner and living room. Upstairs, there are two extra bedrooms, including a dramatic master suite. The uh, main feature of the master bedroom is the vaulted ceiling to have some exposed oak beams put up. Focal points like this can add thousands to the value of your property, but they can have a big effect on the layout of the room. I'm a bit worried about their plans to put a bathroom into the space. There's ways you can fit an ensuite into a square room where you see all the vaulted ceilings without destroying the line of the roof timbers, rather than actually building that as a solid walls right up to the, the rafters. That would be really good to look at, actually, because yeah. it was an area of concern. I mean, the success of this extension, really, is in how well you blend the building you've got already with the building that you're about to build. And you just don't want the bit that you add to it to really jar. When you've got an older property and it's in a style that you love and you're trying to extend it, it opens up lots of questions. Should you do it to match or do it differently? The problem is, if you don't get it right, it can end up looking a bit of a hodgepodge. Over in Hertfordshire, the charming medieval town of Hitchin is one of the top ten places to live in the UK. It has an affluent vibe, decent schools, good independent shops and restaurants, and acres of open space. All this makes it a pricey place to buy. Unless, like electrician Jim Joel and partner Elaine, you can find a cheaper house with potential. We bought it because we loved the area and nice views. Just needed a bigger house and it's what was in our budget. With two daughters and one on the way, the family are using every inch of space and Jim is crying out for his very own man cave. Uh, this room's my, um, my hideout. Uh, that I share with the female dog, the female cat, 
Elaine's washing, Elaine's washing machine. I actually do feel I've been pushed out out of the house. To create space for all the family, mm. Jim has big plans to extend and a deadline of five months for the whole build because that's when daughter number three arrives. The most stress that I get is going to be from her with the dust and the constant cleaning I'm going to have to do once I finish work. I'm not a clean freak. I like things to have their place, I like things to be put back and covered doors to be shut when you've opened them. And <laughs> yeah, but you do clean or hoover twice or three times a day. I have kids. <laughs> if there were an endless pot of money, Jim and Elaine would be buying a bigger house in the same part of this picturesque town. Why is it this area that you'd want to particularly stay in? Our parents are all here, our brothers and sisters and stuff, so stay close to the family. Their ideal home is a great big luxurious new build where everyone in the family can have a room of their own. So what is it about this house that you like? The kitchen is just a nice size and I really like that. Absolutely love the games room. It's a room that, you know, one can get away from all the girls. Because he's a little bit outnumbered, obviously, so I think he needs his own little space as well. So this house is worth about 600,000 and your house is worth about 310,000. So how much do you have? I think we can stretch to about 50,000 maximum on doing the whole build. Crikey. So the whole build for 50,000. The four bed home Jim and Elaine would really like costs well over half a million pounds. As their three bed semi's worth half of that, they'd need almost 300,000 more to afford it. But they have an absolute maximum of just 50 grand to spend. This semi detached house is one of a pair, but really around it is nothing else. It's, it's a rural idyll, really, in many ways. Whilst the location's great, the house layout isn't working for Elaine. The kitchen's too small and situated at the opposite end of the house to the dining room, so mealtimes can be exhausting work. Upstairs, there are two bedrooms, a tiny third bedroom and a family bathroom. So what is it that doesn't work in the kitchen here for you at the moment? Well, as you can see, it's quite a small space and everyone just seems to always want to be around me while I'm, while I'm in here. <laughs> and it gets a bit stressful. So is it partly the fact that you're coming and going and this is a busy place? Yeah. To keep within budget, Jim hopes to do a lot of the work himself with help from mates on a casual basis. He hopes to build a large wraparound two-storey extension. On the ground floor, he'll demolish the conservatory and build a larger kitchen, plus a small playroom for the girls, a utility room, a third bathroom, and a massive garage. Upstairs, they're adding a fourth bedroom at the front of the house with an ensuite bathroom at the back. With their tiny budget, they can't afford to make any mistakes. But I can see a couple of glaring errors right away. At the moment, you're going to have a bathroom that has this amazing view. Yeah, good point. <laughs> well, we better just switch them around so that the bathroom overlooked the drive and the bedroom made the most of this amazing view. Yeah, you want to open yeah. your curtains yeah. and see that every morning, That's not it. just have a bathroom window looking out. Downstairs, they're planning a garage the size of an aircraft hangar, leaving a tiny space for the children's playroom. I wanted to talk to you about your garage, because it comes all the way out to here. <laughs> and that is a vast garage. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it was planning to be my, my space. Time for a rethink. They could have a bigger playroom and you could just nudge a little bit backwards with it. I'm not talking about you only having a cupboard. It's still a nice big man cave, but just not quite this big. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm prepared to compromise on now small garage. <laughs> As the size of Jim's garage is shrinking, so's the budget. So your budget at the moment is 50. That would be a worst case scenario budget. I could get my hands on 25. I could do it for that kind of money, I will. Really, honestly, 50,000 is a very small budget for this. So yeah. to think maybe we'll get away with doing it for half that is really optimistic. No, I think I'll get it watertight for that. Do you think he can do this? Do you think he can pull this off? 
Really? I've got our faith in him, haven't I, really? But Someone's got to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of feeling a little bit worried, actually. Um, you know, the budget and everything, I'm like, hmm. I just haven't got no more money in the pot, my darling. There's nothing I can do about it. That is it, unfortunately. <laughs> Jim and Elaine are creating lots of space, but I'm not sure yet they know quite what to do with it. Add to that the mini budget they've got for a major build, and I fear it could be a case of if, not when, they get this job done. The price gap between rural and city properties is wider than ever, so there's never been a better time to move to open green spaces. But in the idyllic Kent countryside, the rural peace is being shattered. As the extension and restoration work gets underway on Dr Tabitha and Paul Rawlinson's two-bed country cottage. I can't even hear myself speaking at the moment. <laughs> more disruptive than we had it, thought it might be. <laughs> I guess that's the pitfall of living in a, a house that's being extended. But they're struggling through, hoping their 150 grand will bring the cottage back to its former glory after being partially destroyed by fire in the 1970s. Um, not try and make the new part of the property look old, but um, bring the old features into the new side. And that's part of where our anxiety lies. It needs to um, maintain the character of the older part of the property. But with the family planning to live on site throughout, for the project supervisor, Tabitha, blending the old with the new isn't her most pressing concern. William's not coping very well with the noise at all and finding it a bit difficult, I think. Sitting there with his hands over his ears, hiding under the covers. He made the point that uh, he didn't want a bigger house anymore <laughs> this morning. <laughs> over in Hitchin, having scraped together a budget of 50 grand, electrician Jim Joel's ambitious wraparound extension is underway. All right, mate, no worries, that's sound. Calling in favours from mates in the trade, maybe keeping costs down, but it's pushing stress levels up. I'm worrying that my um, ground worker won't turn up, I'm worrying the dumper won't turn up, and I'm worrying the digger won't turn up. Because <laughs> it's eight o'clock and no one's here. But it's not diggers and dumpers that are concerning partner Elaine. I'm really worried about having a messy house, especially as I've got young ch children sort of running around and I'll be having another one. Um, hopefully, most of it will all be done by then. But help eventually shows up. And over the next six weeks, it's a productive site. But as the new extension starts to go up, the autumn rain begins to pour down. And work is rained off. After three and a half months, they're still battling the elements and are behind schedule. Good to see you. Thank you. But another battle's ended, resulting in Man Cave Nil and Girls Playroom One. You've given up some of your garage, which are very yes. good to do. <laughs> Is that through gritted teeth you've given It up? does make more sense to have this room bigger. I think the playroom will be a really nice-sized yeah. room yeah. now. How important to you both is it to have the garage? She doesn't need to see me, then. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just like to have things organised, and he likes everything out where he can see everything. That's the space that can be absolute chaos, and then you can have the house really... Yeah, how I want it. Well, she wants it, yeah. <laughs> it's a great deal. <laughs> hey, hey, Steve, just to confirm, the pack and a half of bricks have got to go back, yeah? All right, mate, no worries, that's lovely. With delays piling up... The bricklayers are delayed by a day as well. There's one non-negotiable deadline looming. So how many weeks have you got left? About five weeks left. Five weeks left before you have the baby? Yeah. <laughs> so what would you hope is done in the next five weeks? Certainly, I would have liked to have seen the knock-through done. 
watertight, knocks through and, and a bit habitable. That was the idea, yeah. But okay. it's not going that way and that's I'll I'll just have to deal with it. Your baby arrives in five weeks, assuming it's bang on time. How many weeks do you think it'll be until you're dry, watertight and you're on to second fix? If we get the break in the weather, sort of four weeks, maybe. Um, really realistically, though? Well, I reckon six weeks before we're um, sort of totally watertight. Do you think you have a similar expectation as to where the house is going to be when the baby arrives? Possibly not. <laughs> Possib yeah, most probably not. So the pressure's on you, really? Yep, it is, yeah. That's the way I like it, you know, living on the edge. So how does Elaine feel about living on the edge? Elaine doesn't know that she's going to be living on the edge, to be honest with you. <laughs> uh. Right. There's an awful lot going on here, and a lot of it is resting on Jim's shoulders. Now, whilst Jim and Elaine are both terribly laid back, I also think they're both rather burying their heads in the sand. So sort of today, it sort of clicked in my head that, wow, we're having a baby. And it's uh, coming very soon. <laughs> in the Kent countryside, six weeks in, and the new extension's about to go up. It's a key day for the Rawlinsons. The truck contains our entire house, minus some oak beams, about £30,000 worth of timbers that have been pre-made. To keep costs down, Tabitha and Paul have opted for a timber frame for the new extension that's been precision engineered off-site. Bit nervous today, hoping it goes smoothly. Obviously, we've got the crane behind us to uh, hopefully position, uh, it, yeah. position it where it needs to be on-site. The timbers come all pre-cut to exact sizes, like an enormous flat pack. Although they do site assessments and stuff like that, and they confidently thought they could easily make it up our track, but they uh, seem to be stuck. <laughs> if they can't get it up here, I don't know what they're going to do, really. The timber frames might be measured to spec, but the lorries aren't, so it's muscle power to get the frames to site. All the supplies we've spoken to, we've, that's the first thing we've highlighted is access. Um, and they all start off by saying, no, it's not a problem, we've got into places smaller. But then today's a great example of that. You know, they've brought the wrong size vehicle along to try and get, you know, try and do a job in a quicker time frame. And it's going to end up ta having taken them much longer because they've had to do it all by hand. Frames like these, made in a controlled environment, often end up being cheaper than carpenters working on site. Timber frames can be built throughout the winter months, whereas brickwork has to stop if the temperature drops below two degrees. This kind of system has been used for decades commercially, but is now revolutionising domestic projects, as in many cases it's an economic and faster way to build. For more information about extending your house or increasing your floor space, check out my scrapbook at channel4.com forward slash beanie. True to form, the timber frame is up in days, and I'm back to check on progress. Has it all gone according to plan so far? We've had one huge, great big disaster uh, that we'll show you. Upstairs, in what will be the master suite, the pre-manufactured frame is installed. But now there's a problem with the oak beam centrepiece. Why is the ridge not sitting on the oak beam? Uh, it's been cut wrong. So it's pos positioned wrong in the room, but more importantly, it's supposed to be holding the roof up. It's such an important feature. It's the main feature of a vaulted ceiling. You know, we wanted to buy oak and put oak up there, you know, and it's got to look right. It's a very, very expensive mistake. It's £1,200 material, plus labour, plus a crane to put it in into the roof. But replacing it, that in itself is complicated because you've now got the tiles going on. Yes. When is that happening? Hopefully within a week. I think it's worth doing it right, but that is a huge, huge setback. 
The biggest question with an expensive mistake like this is who will pay the thousands to rectify it? Paul and Tabitha or the company that supplied the frames? Setbacks that are really disastrous like the oak beam is just what they don't need. Two families hoping to create the homes they could never afford, especially in today's market where in some areas house prices are rising by up to 6% a year. Deep in rural Kent, Paul and Tabitha Rawlinson are trying to double the size of their two-bedroom cottage. They chose to have the timber frame for their extension manufactured off-site, which in theory should lead to a quick and easy build, but it's proving otherwise. We've had this beautiful oak window made up, it looks gorgeous, and it was the last window they went to fit, and it doesn't fit, and the hole isn't the right size, shape, or anything. The windows aren't the only delay. They're still waiting to find out when the ill-fitting beams for their vaulted ceiling centrepiece will be replaced. And now they're saying next week for the oak. It's like, well, will the oak arrive next week? Will it all be, you know, can we finally get them off of the site so that our builders can get on and do what needs doing? In Hitchin in Hertfordshire, electrician Jim is building an ambitious double-storey extension for his growing family for a really tight budget of 50 grand. But taking on much of the build himself is taking its toll. Yeah, it is a bit of a challenge that I've set myself, but I feel like Superman at the minute, you know, doing the build and trying to create more work uh, so I can repay the money that I'm borrowing. What doesn't kill us makes us stronger. I have had a lot of help from a lot of friends, you know, helping me out for a Sunday roast rather than payment. But it might take more than a few roast spuds to get this build back on track. They're four weeks behind the original four to five month schedule and time waiteth for no man. I think in two weeks time, he's looking at knocking through. Two weeks time, <laughs> baby should be here, which is gonna be stressful itself. Whilst the build is running behind schedule, someone else arrives ahead as daughter number three, Olivia, comes into the world, piling on the pressure for Jim to complete. Yeah, Daddy needs to hurry and finish. Finish what? <laughs> Extension. <laughs> Extension. <laughs> Work continues and baby Olivia is welcomed home to this. I'm going to take some plastic over it. It's just coming through. And it's much messier than Elaine feared. No, I can't be here, not with the kids. I mean, even I'm walking in and I'm like, <clears throat> I can just taste it. So let alone the kids and a new baby. So I want to go. I feel like dirty already. There's dust in the house, Elaine. And uh, if you want to moan at someone, it's John. <laughs> Uh, that look, that look is there to kill me later. But before she throttles Jim, Elaine decides it's time to ship out and take the girls to stay with her brother until the place is habitable again. You know, quite soon that I, I can wire all this area out and plaster it up, plumbers in next week. So, yeah, all, ste all steaming ahead. In Kent, on the Rawlinsons' project to extend their two-bed cottage, it's been a six-week wait for the replacement oak beam for their statement vaulted ceiling. The good news is that the oaks arrived. Bad news is we think there might be a problem. I can hear mumblings of wrong size and things like that. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. But we need to go and find out. <laughs> What's I've, happened? I've, they're supposed to send out a beam, but it will get to machines, so... In some respects, it's hard to make a mistake on it, but for some reason, it's 210, so it's not that much bigger. One side of the original beam was too short, and the timber manufacturers agreed to pay. Now the replacement's a centimetre too thick. 
The only place you're going to really notice that is where the wood comes together, aren't you? No, it's not what we ordered. We ordered for a piece of oak that fits the room in the right position and looks right. I'm sick sort of, of all this compromising. Exposed wooden beams were at the heart of Paul and Tabitha's vision for their cottage. This family can't stomach any further delays, so the decision's made to stick with the oversized beam, but to cut it down to size. We could have sent it back, but where does that leave us on the build? You know, we do actually want to move into this house at some point. The vaulted ceiling will be the master bedroom's central focal point, but they still need to work out how to fit the ensuite into the room. You've got the space to do it there, but I just think that you cut off, you cut the room off at that corner. I just think it would look like it's like it was an afterthought when it's not. This has been in the plan. This ensuite has moved around the plan yeah, from day one. But like, now we've got the building to look at. I don't, I'm not happy with either. It would we'll be have the only to... master suite in the world with the ensuite. Without the ensuite. Suite. <laughs> That's the irony. How wide's a toilet? <laughs> the current plan is to build the ensuite in the corner of the room. But I think this could compromise the vaulted oak beam ceiling, which is such a key feature. But there's an alternative solution, which will give them the wow factor thereafter. This is what you're planning at the moment, which is a bathroom chopped out of the corner of the bedroom. What I wanted to suggest is that instead of having it chopped out of the corner, you actually make a feature of it so it's hidden behind. Ooh, oh, that's very nice. <laughs> if they disguise their bathroom as a freestanding wardrobe, they can create an ensuite and walk-in storage without disrupting their vaulted ceiling. I really like this idea because uh, I always imagined that obviously putting a wall up and segregating an area of the room would mean that you'd have to put the wall to the ceiling. In my, in my eye, you know, it looks really good, really yeah. nice. This is great because um, you get much more storage in a, in a space like that than you would in a couple of individual freestanding wardrobes. So from that perspective, I think it's, it's great. And obviously it has that little bit of luxury to, <laughs> to the room. Absolutely. <laughs> this way, I think you can, you can really embrace the original character and really bring that through and it'll, it'll kind of celebrate the room and then you've got this wardrobe here. When we saw Sarah's suggestion, I thought that was just fantastic. Yeah, I mean, I've always wanted it to, to sort of disappear. Not having a, a wall all the way up through the vaulted ceiling will be worth it, whatever cost, really. In Hitchin, Jim Joel's huge wraparound extension is finally up. Elaine's staying at her brother's house. Uh, me and my cat are living here making the best of it. Aren't we, Smudge? Yeah. With a home full of girls, Jim always felt outnumbered, but now he's feeling lonesome. I want them back. I want the children back. I want my dog back. I want my life back. But, you know, we're getting there. The project may be two months behind schedule, but finally it's coming together. I love it. And at last, Elaine and the kids are able to come home. Jim and Elaine certainly had it tough. They had a new baby, a massive build on a minuscule budget. I'm dying to see how much they've managed to put off. Seven months ago, this house was a drab 1960s semi, lacking in space which wasn't working for Jim, Elaine and their growing family. Now in the location they love, they have a spacious family home that they can all enjoy. Considering that most of what you now see is an extension, this is a seriously impressive home. Hi, hello, hello. how are you? Oh, look, this is a new arrival. Olivia. Oh, gosh, I'm dying to see inside. Let's have a look at it all. Previously, the small kitchen was at the wrong side of the house. Now, at the heart of the home, is the slick, modern kitchen dining space they dreamed of. And this was your main motivating reason, really, for doing the build, the kitchen. I can't believe it's ours. This just feels like grown-up's kitchen. I'm really, really pleased with it. Really pleased with it. It's like a nice family room, which is what we wanted, wasn't it? Standard of life is so Stop. much better than what it was. You've got your garage. <laughs> 
Which you have to stay in sometimes, do you? Yeah, I have a camp bed. <laughs> Adjoining the kitchen diner is a bright and colourful playroom that's thankfully big enough for the girls to enjoy. It would have been up to this point here, so really almost a cupboard, really. <laughs> it would have been, yeah. Glad we made it a little bit bigger. <laughs> yeah, you're going to have this enormous garage and then a tiny, tiny playroom. I feel really proud that, you know, I've done this for the children. And they're close as well. You know, they're not up in their bedrooms out of the way. They're with us. The disorganised utility room was the hideaway for house clutter. The cat, the dog and Jim. In its place is a state-of-the-art garage complete with an adjoining wet room and ample storage for Jim's work tools and the family bikes. Well, that really is fantastic. In the mornings now, I can, you know, come in here at seven and be out of here by quarter past seven with all the gear I need so I don't have to rummage around finding things. It's really good for work, really practical, and having the wet room off this room is great. It's great, yeah. Cause... I don't need to go in the house. I don't get moaned at, so <laughs> I can get showered and in, in, in I go, yeah. Jim and Elaine now have a house they love. With Jim's hands-on approach, he's created a home for all of his family's needs. But the crucial question, has he done it within budget? I can't get away from how much it costs. You were hoping to do all of this for 50,000. How much did you end up spending? I think we was just a little bit shy of our budget, but we've done it. So that is seriously incredible. I mean, that, It's a long, long days, that, long nights, but it has been with a lot of help from a lot of people. I'll be working for free now for the next 10 years, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Jim and Elaine's dream house was worth £600,000. Nearly twice as much as the house they were living in. But they've created their perfect home for just under 50 grand. A staggering £240,000 less than it would have cost them to buy their dream home. And I guess the other really good news is that if you did decide to sell this, you would be able to get half a million pounds for this. So you've created £140,000 of capital in this house. Wow. That is music to my ears. <laughs> I think he's done a really, really good job. Really proud of him. So one happy family and one project wrapped up. But for Tabitha and Paul, there's still no end in sight. It, has the insulation arrived? No. As they're plagued by further supply issues. When is anything going to happen? It's just, it's getting a bit much. In Kent, the finished date on Paul and Tabitha's extension has been and gone. The issue with the oak beams has caused a two-month delay. And although sorted now, there's a further battle with supply issues. It, has the insulation arrived? No, not yet. <laughs> OK. I suppose we've still got a couple of hours on that one. Um, but when is anything going to happen, you know? <laughs> it's just, it's getting a bit much. Home builds can be incredibly stressful, so if you have to down tools during a build, but still haven't made those final decisions on the finishing touches, get out and about and take inspiration from existing homes and buildings. Throughout this project, Paul and Tabitha have been determined to blend the old with the new, and this 16th century local pub shows how it's done. Oh, I like the butcher's block. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I wonder if there's any way we could incorporate something like that. And Tabitha's immediately blown away. I love these things hanging from the ceiling. I like the way they've got, like, the modern lighting, but it's so simple. Oh, I love that, yeah, I love that. Actually, I'm far more interested in what on earth that is. Before they get too carried away, there's one feature I particularly want to draw their attention to. Obviously, having this through fireplace is a really big, fantastic focal point. The benefits of the heat, you get both sides. And there's this lovely peephole into next door. You know, it just all adds to the charm, because it gives you a little flavour of what might be there. 
in the sort of style of cottage that you're trying to create, it's probably spot on. It's been six challenging months for the Rawlinson family. With a dream of upsizing in their perfect countryside location, they've battled living with a young family on site. Trucks that couldn't deliver. And an unrelenting oak beam saga. I'm sick of all this compromising. But now the dream of restoring this picturesque cottage to its former glory is almost a reality. Starting to see the finishing touches now as we've wanted them. So, uh, and there's a real sort of energy on site. And the build powers ahead to completion. A huge chunk of this house had been destroyed by fire, so the extension that they were building really needed to match and blend in with the original building and, of course, all the surrounding houses. Before, the cottage had oodles of character, but it was more the size of a doll's house than a growing family home. Now this picture-perfect property has been sympathetically doubled in size. You know, that is truly seamless. You actually couldn't tell where the original house ended and the new house starts. This looks fab. Okay. Very exciting. Oh, I love it. Before, the cottage was dark and cluttered. Now, on entering the house, there's an immediate sense of space, bathed in natural light. Being able to make it a quite a grand entrance for such a little cottage has been a bit unique, really. And having really beautiful joinery makes a difference as well. And as soon as you walk through the door, you see it. Yeah. And, and, uh, that, and that carries on throughout. I hoped that this is how it was going to end up because I think it's absolutely fantastic. Um, there's a lot of pressure to get it right. And boy, did they get it right with the kitchen. Before, it was so tiny there wasn't even enough room for the essentials. Now, this gorgeous open-plan kitchen diner is bigger, brighter and packed with modern appliances whilst retaining a classic period feel. You've done a fantastic job in here of blending the old with the new. I just love the traditional look, but that we've got everything in the right place. We've also managed to hide all of the gadgets. When you've got a fridge in the kitchen, which is a luxury, yeah. isn't yeah. it? Because you had to go next door for the fridge because it wasn't big enough for yeah. a fridge. I haven't had a fridge in a kitchen for three years, and now we've got two. Oh, right. <laughs> Where's the second one? <laughs> just here. Oh, right. Oh, that's great. The mod cons are subtle, but period charm is everywhere. And I'm glad to see they took inspiration from the trip to the pub. So this is your dining room fireplace and your kitchen fireplace. Yeah. yeah. And, and you get the benefit of the heat from both sides when the fire's on. And the beauty of it from both sides, it's the focal point of both rooms. Which again is pleased. fairly traditional. We have a, a focal point as the fireplace and not the TV. It's almost in the heart of the house as well. So. Mm. You know, yeah. we're really pleased with that. I just think it's been great that we've had this opportunity to make it how we want it, but still stay true to how it was. I'm quite pleased with the outcome, but I suppose I would be, it's mine. <laughs> <laughs> Upstairs, the basic two-bedroom layout is no more, and in place are three spacious bedrooms, and the master suite with the all-important oak beam ceiling. Oh, it's such a lovely bedroom, but that is the offending beam, isn't it, that caused so much ha yeah. hassle. Was that the most stressful moment of Absolutely, the build? yeah. You know, I'm not in construction, and to me that looked like a big job to put that right, and, uh, and it was. <laughs> it was yeah. definitely worth it. It looks absolutely fantastic. You had a vision for it, and you stuck by it, and you said, no, that's what we want, and definitely worth it. Yeah. And they masqueraded their ensuite at the edge of the room. That's great, what a lovely ensuite. I think every option for that ensuite 
we exhausted would have just impacted on the room or sacrificing part of another room just to get the ensuite in. Um, whereas I think what we've ended up with is something that looks really great and is actually a perfect use of the space. This project was more than about creating space. It was about restoring a cottage to its former glory. Its dramatic features led to dramatic problems, but determinedly, Paul and Tabitha have stuck by their vision and now have a beautiful, spacious home, which feels as though it's been here for centuries. I think we feel like we're borrowing someone else's house at the moment. <laughs> feels like we're in, inside a magazine. <laughs> yeah, that's how I truly feel, yeah, yeah. So yeah. is it now your dream house? Yes, absolutely. absolutely yes. Yeah. You bought the house for three hundred and sixty thousand, didn't you? Mm. And you were planning on spending one hundred and fifty thousand on it. Mm. And you, how, how much did you end up spending? About one hundred and sixty thousand. So okay. not, not too bad. So that's a total of five hundred and twenty thousand pounds on buying it and refurbishing it. Mm -hmm. Their dream house was worth eight hundred and fifty thousand pounds. £490,000 more than their original property. But Tabitha and Paul have managed to create their ideal home for £160,000, saving them £330,000 and making them a very healthy profit. I think it's reasonable to suppose that this would be worth about £700,000. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so it was worth it. Yeah. It's £180,000 of equity you've made. Yeah. Great. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> It's good to know. Yeah. But we're not going anywhere. It's not for sale at that price. <laughs> Paul and Tabitha have created a beautiful home that's risen out of the ashes. And now they have a fabulous home that they can enjoy with their children into the future.